Hello friends, welcome to the universe inside a plant world. So, uh, hanging out here with a couple of my plant friends and uh, I really wanted to uh, show you this beautiful mullein stalk. And uh, also, there's power. There's our idea of power. Lines. This is uh, another idea of power. And uh, this plant actually is a very powerful medicinal and we know uh, the flowers are very helpful in case of infections uh, so many people make infused oils from uh, mullein flowers which are, are very uh, rigorous to gather you know take some time and uh, you can actually infuse those in any kind of infused oil and that could be then strained and you can work with that as a topical for uh, basically cases of heat inflammation it can soothe the inflammation of course, you should always uh, forage respectfully, that is taking the, from pollinators, etc. So you should think that through as to where you're taking it. So I would say 10 to 30% of anything that you are harvesting is a pretty good number uh, for flowers. And of course, uh, increase habitat however you can. Plug in my little machine because I just saw my battery is getting low. Ta-da! Survival machine. <clears throat> Welcome everybody. Now that I have my survival machine plugged in, and you're all joined in the portal. Uh, the other good thing about this plant, as far as talking about power, is this stalk right here uh, makes fire. And one could, <clears throat> this is a little thick for my taste, everybody likes different sizes of mullein stalks, but uh, this mullein stalk, if uh, whittled down with a knife, uh, if you if you get rid of all the edge there and make it nice and smooth, there's a pithy uh, center to this and other plants. And that actually is uh, the base of a hand drill fire. You wouldn't want to use it for a bow drill if you're familiar with that. But uh, mullein stalks, of course, have a hand drill fire hidden within them. So uh, it's very interesting because uh, I was just camping and in a cabin, really, and basically living by the fire. And last night it had rained, and I had been chosen I kind of try to choose little <clears throat> steps for myself so in this case I found this on the ground actually this is a, a magnesium ferrocium rod All right and this one's actually quite a crappy one it's a little too small it's not good to learn on but I have a couple others the strike force etc and so um, for three days we lived on the wood stove by lighting fire from this with gathered tinder and charred cloth that I had made previously and just such a, a beautiful way to, I was just walking and I realized that, you know, every, every bit of food that we ate came from starting that fire and having that fire going. So imagine if you lived in a reality right now where instead of seeing power, you know, from power lines, um, you saw power from the power plants, the powerful plants, right? Or <clears throat> that you would live in a world uh, or that you could... Uh, anthropologically experiment with the idea of living in that way to see kind of how far you can take it and to test your skills and that's really uh, what I envision doing with Return to Nature is sharing those skills and helping proliferate that so please help spread the word in any way if y'all have any questions please let me know I'll be uh, checking out lots more plants as I go I've got some other harvests here's a nice one this is pretty much the dead stock of basically the precursor to grain, right? Uh, these are the grass family, probably a panicum. Funny, the grasses are called panicums, and they contain DMT. Talk about panic. They're like 98% of all grasses or something. Nobody really knows how many grass species contain dimethyltryptamine, but definitely a lot of them. Arun Arundo donax definitely does in the roots. Um, wouldn't it be a joke if uh, the universe made it so that DMT was actually in uh, lawn grass, like in high concentrations, and we never realized it? And so now, basically, the dominator culture, with its trying to sterilize nature, created free DMT everywhere. Now, that would be a funny conclusion to this mess, wouldn't it? So, <clears throat> actually, this plant right here is a precursor of other commercial wheat. And uh, what I want to mention to you all... Watch out for ticks. I had my first deer tick on me already. It's barely March. Um, we didn't have much of winter. I have a solution. It's called climate fluctuation. 
if we would have just called it that, I don't think we would have been dealing with so much stagnation. So um, that aside, this plant um, actually was artificially selected, a plant similar to this, was artificially selected for larger size grains, right, and bigger yields. And after about 20 or 30, well, let's say uh, 20,000 years of selecting that, we've created certain, yes, genetic modifications, but that doesn't mean GMOs. There's a whole different argument there. Don't be confused by Neil deGrasse Tyson. This is an artificial selection that does genetically modify the seeds. And I want to talk about the precursors to why someone would pick this plant. And so as a hunter-gatherer society uh, starting to become agrarian, what ended up happening was we started to grow more uh, uh, grain. And basically, we are in the midst of what started off as a grain war. And Egypt was one such kingdom, and something was going on in Jerusalem. It's hard to tell at that time. We had Sumeria or Babylon, depending on which age you're looking at. Um, China also. And they all had grains. You know, they all had basically the ability to start a commerce system based on sequestering grains and money is known to have come from barter for example because basically you'd get taxed you needed you as a peasant needed you worked in the fields you needed at the end of the day ten dollars worth of grain so you'd go to the cash-in store the banker and they would give you ten dollars of grain and you would go and you would continue to work in the field and you were a farmer you worked monoculture and you basically worked as a peasant and then there was the monarchy so this is pretty much the society that we entered um, probably 10,000 BC and this has been going on ever since and it's just gotten more and more out of control and of course it went from grain to gold to sugar to tea um, to oil and now we're in a fossil fuel war or we're in a uh, uh, basically a battle royale of energy sources which there's one huge one of course called the sunlight which would be kind of a socialist the sunlight is all about socialism it's like hey free energy for everybody no problem just build solar panels you'll never have to fight over all this shit again but no but no you know the children so that dominator culture which kind of has ingrained enslaved us um, through the question of grain we don't realize but botanically we selected by certain characteristics that may not have actually benefited the resilience of the plant or the resilience of the physical body, uh, not to mention the mind or the spirit. So when you select seed for money, you usually do it based on two characteristics, size and sweetness, generally. When you think about berries, right? So blueberries are not what they are wild, right? I go pick wild blueberries, they're very small. Uh, you know, you go out and you buy blueberries in the store. Some of them could be abnormally, obnoxiously silly, huge. And that's because basically there was this selection for certain characteristics, which is generally size and sweetness. What happened as a result of that is that we basically thought we were outsmarting nature, but in essence, nature, we started to break nature. That's the first time we kind of started to manipulate nature with human will, thinking that we're basically the co-creator here, which leads to, oh, I'm the dominator here. Nature is at my will because I'm so powerful based on power, power, power plants. Yeah, the power plant. Isn't it funny that nature tricked these people into still calling it a power plant? <laughs> Back to DMT in the grass. Uh, but anyway, so... This plant has basically been uh, one of those precursors. It's called foxtail grass, and it grows pretty much everywhere and would grow in somewhat monoculture, like in uh, meadows where they wouldn't mow. But of course, during power lines, they not only mow a lot, but they also spray uh, pesticides because they have the idea that uh, a pl itty bitty plant like this may cause a fire for that. Uh, so these places get heavily treated, so we wouldn't necessarily want to harvest them from food. But you leave it alone, and it would create a grain polyculture. Uh, very interestingly enough, so here we would have a grain polyculture in a meadow. Welcome, friends. Welcome, friends. The power plants are with us. D. Buckley says, could always splice plants 
that put our higher voltage like potatoes and other plants making a power plant. Well, you can't actually spice splice uh, that much of a diversity of plants. Um, basically, if you start doing splicing and you don't do anything too bizarre or toxic to the plant, uh, what you probably would find is that you can only splice plants. And this is to D. Buckley's question, which says you could always splice plants that put our higher voltage, like potato, put out higher voltage like potatoes and other plants, making a power plant. Uh, both, I imagine you mean metaphorically as well as physically. Um, potatoes do generate electricity, and you can get a, a, a light bulb to turn on from potatoes. So they do have electrical charge. They also have um, Krillian energetic uh, response, also an aura. We will come to realize someday that those are all the same exact thing. Um, and so potatoes actually have the ability to emit, emit a charge. Now, that said, you wouldn't be able to necessarily splice uh, a potato with foxtail grass. For example, you would probably need to narrow it down by family, botanical families. So you could probably splice grasses with grasses. common example that comes to mind is actually uh, cannabis and hops are in the hemp family. And sometimes what people do actually is they'll uh, splice hops roots with cannabis uh, upper portions of their plants. So, and they take, and that causes a certain hybrid. Um, there are also a lot of genetic hybridizations for creating tulips, for example, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of that is done in the lab, causing splicing, uh, which they do often use root hormones so you can get a little further that way if you wanted to replace root hormone which is probably some sketchy, sketchy chemical you can actually use uh, concentrated willow bark tea that has its own rooting hormone in it so if you did want to experiment with trying to make franken plants in a way that was not uh, uh, harmful or deadly to our species um, then you can definitely work with willow bark tea, which is easily available all over the woods, um, as long as the woods remain a place that you're allowed to go, as long as, uh, you know, it's, it is true that in most parks, if you go there and you start harvesting willow bark tincture, they do have the law on their side to say that you are illegally removing vegetation when, you know, they prune all the time. Um, let's see... So, you know, do I carry a flashlight at all? No, I actually barely use a flashlight. I even set up my hammock in the dark. Um, I, I have one in my camping kit, and luckily it's actually solar powered. Um, through I have a small solar charger and uh, an anchor. Uh, it's about $30, and that goes and plugs into my headlamp, which is a diamond bat diamond. And that actually has a USB charge. They're starting to make the first headlamp, so that's about 50 bucks, which is, you know, and then that has rechargeable batteries, which I can then charge off of other devices. Um, and so that's kind of the way that I try to go. Now, the eyes adjust. The more you're outside, the more you observe, um, and the less you use light, uh, the more you adjust. And also, it's two ways of walking. There are a million of ways of walking, but when you walk in the dark, you don't walk like you uh, do in, in the daytime. So you slow down, you crouch your knees, you move slower, you put your arms in front of your face so that no sticks get you, uh, whack you in the face or you know vines, anything like that. And you would move extremely slowly. You wouldn't trudge through the woods like a modern uh, person. So those are kind of the uh, practices that we have to remember but um yeah that's a pretty good flashlight and that's some good gear and i think that's one of the ways that you can get yourself off of the system uh in a little bit i mean i should say start weaning yourself from the system and that's a very important distinction uh that's what happens when you read comments as well as talk <laughs> uh yeah, I think Yulka says, uh, good to know those areas are treated. I definitely think that they are um, treated. I've never seen under power lines, at least anywhere that I've ever been, which is uh, overgrown. It's actually diverse. They don't, uh, 
what is the word? They don't actually uh, make it. They don't actually like monoculture it, but it is uh, pretty much kept away. Fidgeting with phone. Be right back. Hello, friends. Yeah. Um, also, your phone is a flashlight, so don't forget that. Uh, Chrissy mentions, I've bought willow bark to propagate plants. You can make one at home with a high enough concentration. Yes, you sure can. Um, you don't need rooting hormone. You could just uh, uh, cook down. I mean, you could probably even boil it, but I would just say simmer down a willow bark tincture till it gets, I mean, um, in tea, willow bark in water. And you then um, can just simmer it down until it gets pretty thick. And I know there's rooting hormone in there. Willow and elderberry, two of very few trees, which you can take a cutting and stick it anywhere in the ground, and you can actually grow it. So um, they're pretty resilient, and they're pretty self, self-creating. Uh, looking at birch, I, this is one of the things that um, I worked with for that fire tool that I was mentioning before ferrocium or magnesium and so this is not the birch I would work with this is a white birch and this this would be okay um, you could you can make this work but I also found a whole bunch of paper bark birch that's one of the good ones it's much fluffier it's much easier to take a spark so restocking from the weekend of uh, hanging out with Sage and Angie in a beautiful cabin and just living by the fire and teaching sage, all kinds of nature things, and today we went for lots of great walks, and yesterday as well. So, um, basically, the vision is to just continue to try to get this van, the forage mobile going, and start taking sage and Angie around, uh, traveling and touring and doing workshops, sometimes all together, sometimes just by myself, and uh, just starting to travel around and forage and look at the world differently and share uh, with you all what I find. So if you're interested in to support this uh, work to continue to thrive, please feel free to check out my GoFundMe page, uh, gofundme.com backslash return to nature. And there you can see uh, the vision I've put forth for the gypsy van culture. I think it's very important. Uh, I've done a lot of research in vans and van dwellings and the idea is that I think there's going to be people who get land uh, or have land and then there's going to be people who are roving and those two kind of cultures are going to be uh, the, the, the foreground of the return to nature where we basically build the eco villages from the ground up together and stop waiting for politicians to do it and Standing Rock was the first of many of those uh, explosions of creative, loving, powerful, prayerful energy. And that's going to continue. And so I see some of us are gypsies and we want to rove. And we'll be like the hunter-gatherers riding on mastodons in the form of fossil fuel vehicles that hopefully and prayerfully, if we get the right minds together, um, will build m- modifications for those engines to run on multiple sources. Um, innovation is not dead. It's suppressed. And we need to find the others and we need to start thinking uh, globally and acting locally, to quote such a wonderful qu- cliche, but very true. Um, so, you know, be the one that you've been waiting for. It's time to wake up and it's time to relearn your home and to be a protector of your home and to look at what's happening in your ecosystem and all these teachings and tools start plugging you into uh, paying attention to what's going on and if we don't have people who pay attention then that's exactly uh, how a lot of uh, environmental devastation starts to happen if you've noticed so uh, remember that you are significant and that you have a role to play in the awakening of human consciousness and continue to spread your magic however you can however you will sending you all many blessings have a beautiful evening